Uh, good morning, everyone. Great to be here with you this morning. And Xin Yuan Wai Lu. That's the best I can do. Happy Chinese New Year to everyone here this morning uh, for Friday and also a happy uh, Lunar New Year for other cultures that celebrate New Year at this time as well. Uh, just a reminder that we do have a, an outline of the sermon in, uh, inside the church paper. Oh, there's a cute little girl on that, although she's very nice, isn't she? Um, and there's also a phone number there, a mobile number. We're going to have Q&A at the end of the sermon. So if you have any questions, uh, just send them off to that mobile number. Uh, it's so great to be here. I've been back at work for a little while now, but it's uh, this is my first time uh, preaching since uh, I had my uh, kidney transplant operation. Uh, thank you so much to all those who have uh, prayed for me and uh, continue to pray for me as well. I suppose you never really know uh, what to expect. You know, I never really knew what to expect when I had the transplant. But, you know, what I've learned from this experience is that, you know, God's love, God's uh, closeness to you is uh, so important. You know, so much in life is uncertain in all parts of our lives, you know, but God is the one who we can depend on no matter what happens. Let me uh, tell you this story. It's a true story. It's about... Uh, a president, President Richard Nixon of the US, who resigned from office on the 9th of August, 1974. And he did so in shame and disgrace. Because, you see, he did illegal stuff, which they referred to, they call now Watergate. He's the only US president ever forced to resign from office. Then, a few years later, in 1978, there was a funeral for a former vice president of America, Herbert Humphrey. And so because of this funeral, you know, lots of dignitaries came from around the world and, of course, many politicians from uh, the US came uh, for this event. And, in fact, this was the first time Nixon had come back to Washington and Nixon was a re Republican. As they were sitting around, you know, everybody was sitting, chatting, catching up with people, catching up with friends. But no one went anywhere near Nixon. No one would talk to him. No one would even look at him. No one wanted anything to do with him. He just sat in a corner by himself. Then... The current president of the US, Jimmy Carter, who's a Democrat, comes into the room. He sees Nixon there by himself. He goes over to him. He greets him. He greets him like a member of his family. He smiles at him, shakes his hand, and the two men embrace and then Jimmy Carter says to him, Welcome home, Mr. President. Welcome home. You know, that's exactly how we should treat one another in church too. As a family. You know, no matter what our differences, even when we make big mistakes. We're to be a forgiving community, you know, embracing one another as a family of God together. In the church family, no one is better than anyone else. Uh, let me remind you about this letter of First Thessalonians, which uh, Paul wrote. Now, he wrote it when he arrived in Corinth 
Uh, it would have been sometime around uh, AD 50 to 51. Uh, Paul had received a report about the church from Timothy, who had been there. And so this church was only about, you know, six to uh, 12 months old. It's uh, made up of, obviously, of recent converts. Most of them are Gentiles, but they're facing a lot of persecution, particularly from Jews. The people come from all different parts of Thessalonian society. So, you know, it can be easy to see that relations can easily be strained. You know, Paul wrote this letter because he wanted to encourage them. You know, he was overjoyed to hear the news from Timothy that these guys, even under persecution, they were doing so well in their faith. But Paul also wanted to correct some issues. Uh, one, of course, was about the second coming of Jesus. And he also wanted to talk to them about other moral issues, practical matters, particularly how to how to live together in the church community. And that's exactly the passage that we're going to look at today. Now, uh, as we begin our passage, let's start with verses 12 to 13. Uh, uh, section 1, the relationship with our leaders. Remember, uh, Thessalonia here is made up of, uh, it's a young church, so you can just imagine the leaders are basically no older in Christ than the rest of the congregation. Paul tells them to respect. He tells them to esteem and to love their leaders. Give them recognition. Appreciate them those who God has placed in this leadership role over you. Recognise them for the ministry role that they have, the spiritual gifts that they have, not because of who they are, but rather because of the role that they have, the work that they do. They labour among you as ministers of the gospel, as leaders of your community. That's their role. Appreciate them for that. Paul says, those who admonish you. This might very well have been the issue. You know, none of us like to be told off about something, do we? I mean, we don't like to be corrected by other people. For someone to tell us about a sin in our life, and they point it out to us. It's so easy to you know, react against that, isn't it? Hey, that's not really a sin. The Bible doesn't say you can't smoke cannabis. I don't gossip. I just tell people about it so they can pray about it. You wouldn't forgive someone if they did that to you. But, you know, as pastors and elders, our role is to be good shepherds of God's people. You know, to point out error and and to teach and to build up and to encourage the whole congregation. It was John Stott who wrote, to admonish means to warn against bad behaviour and its consequences and to reprove, even discipline those who have done wrong. It's often also coupled with teaching. As we point out, sin in people's lives, we teach them from God's word as well. But how do we esteem our church leaders? Well, you have to get to know them first, don't you? Know them as a person. You know, at the moment, we have five pastors and three elders at this church. We have uh, Pastor Sam Reeve, Sandy Citro, Abram Gunn, and Tech Yu Lao, uh, who looks after our Mandarin congregation and myself. And our three elders are David May, who's the chairman of elders, uh, Peter Brunstrup, and uh, Chi Kum Tay, or we call him CK. 
it's hard to get to know all the leaders of the church. But, you know, it would be great if you really got to know well at least one leader of the church. Maybe you could invite them over for dinner. You know, pray for them regularly. Ask them, you know, what they're doing and, and, you know, how you can pray for them. And perhaps, you know, when you get to know them, you might even like to say to them, you know, what can I do to help you? What can I do to serve the church? You know, a church can never do really well if its leaders aren't supported lovingly by its congregation. Section 2, relationship with one another, verses 14 to 15. Paul says, we urge you, brothers. Now, he's speaking to the whole congregation, the whole church here. He says, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. You see, one size doesn't fit us all, does it? It would be wrong to encourage the idle. They need a strong word of warning. We'd be very insensitive, wouldn't we, if we admonish the faint-hearted who need a kind word of encouragement. You know, we have to deal sensitively with each other, don't we? We're not all in the same position. We do this because we want everyone to grow and to become mature in Christ. And we may all be at different points uh, in that in our lives. Now, admonish the idol. Paul tells them, and I think it's likely that he's saying this because um, a number of them, because they were expecting Jesus to return very soon, they quit their jobs and they just sponged off everybody else. You can look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verses 6 to 12. Uh, now, I don't like admonishing people. None of us like to do that. But I and the other pastors and elders know that it's an important part of you know, shepherding God's people. If you truly love your brothers and sisters in Christ, then you will point out error and sin in their lives, sensitively and confidentially. We need to be intolerant of sin in our own lives, but also in the lives of others as well. Now, to encourage the faint-hearted. The faint-hearted are people who may be easily discouraged or perhaps overwhelmed by the situation in their lives, perhaps by stresses in their lives. Paul might very well have been thinking about those who were um, over-concerned or overwhelmed about the fact that some of their loved ones had died before Jesus had returned. You can see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18. How do we help such people? I remember reading about a man called Joseph Bailey. Joseph Bailey lost three sons at different points in his life. And he wrote these words. I was sitting, torn by grief. Someone came and talked to me about God's dealings, of why it had happened, of hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things that I knew were true. But I was unmoved, except to wish that he'd go away. And finally he did. Another person came and sat beside me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask leading questions. He just sat beside me for an hour or more. He listened when I said something. He answered briefly, prayed very simply, 
and then he left. I was moved. I was comforted. I hated to see him go. May we treat one another with the comfort and with a kind of sensitivity that that man treated Joseph Bailey. The third point he makes, and be patient with everyone. Uh, what can we say about this? Well, don't trade an insult for an insult. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Don't have a short fuse. Proverbs fifteen eighteen. Understand that the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. James 1, 20. You know, if we're not patient with people, we're not really loving them, are we? 1 Corinthians 13, 4. God has been so patient with us. We need to treat other people the same way. You know, in our culture today, we're very modern, Western society. You know, we think we're better than others. We think we're better than past generations. You know, we do good to people who we like. We do good to people who do good to us. But Christian faith tells us to do good to those who do evil to you. Verse 15. Why is that? Because, you see, evil never produces good. Don't seek to get even. Revenge is something that we are never to follow. You know, as a Christian, we're to take the evil that, that people give us and then respond to it only with good. Not by turning our heads. We actually have to respond to it with good. Because that's how God has responded to us. Romans 12 to 1, 12 21 says it well. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What if I made it my aim to make sure that not only do I forgive every person who does wrong to me, but that I actually go out of my way to make sure that I serve that person, to do something good to them, to say a kind word or, or do an act of kindness to them. Wouldn't that be great? But honestly, I mean, honestly, you know, I could never do that. It's too big for me. I mean, to do that to everyone that hurts you, I mean, it's, 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 I couldn't do it. Of course, Jesus did that, but not me. No, I suppose God could do it. He could do it through us, couldn't he? Maybe if we let him. Maybe that's what we should all do. Ask God. Expect him to help us. To enable us to do to do through us what we can't do ourselves. Maybe just a thought. Uh, point three on our outline. Relationship with God, verses 16 to 24. Most people, you know, only see our outer life, don't they? They only see our outward actions. Maybe a few people 
see something a bit deeper in your life, if you let them. But God knows our heart, doesn't he? He sees our motives, our attitudes and our real character. In these verses, Paul is asking the question, what does God think about us? Paul tells them to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing and to give thanks in every circumstance. This is the will of God, he says, in Christ Jesus for you. Perhaps a little summed up version of the Christian life. How do we do it? By always being connected to Jesus. Are you connected to Jesus today? Have you been connected to Jesus this past week, the past month, the past year? Are you always connected to Jesus? Then verse 19 goes on to tell us, don't quench, subdue, or extinguish the Holy Spirit who lives in you. You know, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. And the Holy Spirit ministers to us. You know, he teaches us, he guides, the Holy Spirit directs us, he rebukes us as well. He opens up our minds to understand scripture. The Holy Spirit gives joy, peace and love. And he transforms our lives. He transforms our character from one degree of glory to another. But we can resist the Holy Spirit just by saying no to God. I'm going to do it my way. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and not do what I tell you? Then it goes on in verses 20 to 21. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. When it speaks here about prophecies, we have to distinguish between that and between the prophets of the Old Testament and Jesus and the apostles in the New Testament. They had the authoritative word of God. What they said became infallible scripture. While prophecy today is human reporting of a divine revelation. And so, you know, it's mixed with human imperfection and needs to be tested, it needs to be sifted through. That's what Paul is saying here. So in no way do today's prophecies have authority over our lives in the same way that Scripture does. Scripture is closed, it's final, it's finished, it's our foundation. It's not a building in progress. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verses 37 to 38. See, the point that Paul's making is don't swallow every teaching or spiritual experience that comes along as if it must be from God. If someone says that they have a word of God for you, we're not to reject it, but neither are we to accept it untested. We need to weigh it carefully. Now, John Stott gives these five very helpful tests, I think, from Scripture about how we are to test um, uh, words of prophecy. First of all, like the Bereans, we're to test that what is said, uh, we're to test what is said against Scripture. Does it line up with Scripture? If it doesn't, it's not from God. Who do they say that Jesus is? 
Who do they say Jesus is? Do they confess that Jesus is God himself, that he died on the cross for our sins and that he rose again? Who do they say Jesus is? Do they pervert the gospel, the true gospel? Is the teaching in line with the gospel? Fourthly, what about the character of the person? You'll recognise them by their fruit. Now, this is a big argument, I believe, against not listening to people, to people who are strangers to you or people that you don't know very well because you don't know what their character is like. And fifthly, does it build up? Does it encourage and strengthen and comfort? Does it benefit the church? But let me add to that, that if it is truly from God, then God will confirm it to you. It'll come true. If it doesn't come true, then it wasn't a word from God. Deuteronomy chapter 18 Verses 21 to 22. Verse 22 then goes on to say that we are to abstain from every form or kind of evil. If there's sinfulness in your life, it needs to be taken out. A Christian and evil just don't mix. No evil can be allowed into our lives in the things that we do, in the things that we say, in how we think and in what we teach as well. Verses 23 to 24, God is working to completely sanctify us and God will surely do it. You know, they're very simple words. God will surely do do it. They're very direct. No qualifications, no hesitation, no doubt of any kind. He didn't say God might do it or that God could do it. Paul didn't even say God will do it if you do your part. It's just a simple statement of fact. God will surely do it. You know, when all's said and done, it's not our grip on God that counts, but the fact that God has a hold of us. John 10, 28 to 29. I'd like to ask you, how has God spoken to you this morning? through this letter of 1st Corinthians sorry 1st Thessalonians how are you going to apply what you've heard today in your life how are you going to apply this letter to your life how can all of us encourage one another to live together in Christian community in this church in the way that Paul has taught the Thessalonians, the way that God wants us to live. You know, God is the one who will hold on to you because he is faithful. We can depend on him. He will surely do it for certain. Let's agree with God and allow him to do that in our lives today and in our church as well. Let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks, Lord, for all that you have done and all that you will do. We know that you are Lord of all. We thank you, Lord, for what you did with the Thessalonian church. We thank you for Paul writing these words, Lord, that can encourage and help us, Lord, to grow in our faith 
and to grow in our character to be more like Jesus. Help us, Lord, to know who you are and to seek to become more like you. Not only, Lord, in what we say and do, but in our hearts as well. Thank you, Lord, that you will surely do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.